Who is joining me in welcoming the co writer, co producer, and director of JFK, Oliver Stone.
the July 4th weekend and announced that from here on out, uh, the, uh, any, any new information would have, would, that would be released uh, would have to be to go through a process of enormous amount of, you have to go and prove, I don't know what you have to prove, frankly, it's just that they don't have to prove anything. They, they call it a, ma a matter of, at that point, they called it a matter of COVID and national security, the combination of COVID. <laughs> it's, it's, it becomes ridiculous, as you know. And here we are in 2000, it'll be 20, uh, 2020, 2023. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, it's a joke, it's a real joke. Well, it's so crazy. I mean, you know, for people who don't realize, this movie is one of the few films that actually had a very concrete, real world impact in the sense that a year after this came out, because of the discussions that came out around this movie, Congress did pass that act that said the records would be released. And I don't understand, you know, why do you think this has happened in the last year? Why do you think Trump and Biden, like, what, these pressures are on them, what, what's your theory as to why this stuff can't come out? Well, uh, obviously, the wolf, you know, the, the fox said in the chicken coop here. So, I mean, the fox is not gonna let this stuff out. It's, it's, as Bobby Kennedy Jr. said on quite openly, he said these files were probably most likely pertain to the CIA people who work the Cuban operation. And that would include Abby Phillips, who would include uh, Joe Nees, George Joe Nees, who would include Bill Harvey, who would include Jesus Christ, that guy uh, from uh, Mor uh, Morales, the, uh, the, the guy in Arizona who was a sniper. No, it was a it was a cipher during the Vietnam went along to kill a lot of people in Vietnam. Um, Clayton killed Pete Morales, who was in the Indian famous city. Those are the kind of people and that's where you want to and I'd love to get files on Richard Helms and of course Alan Dulles, but Dulles is probably off is off I don't know what they're gonna do with Dulles is somewhere it's all buried, it's all there. There are files of some kind. Of course they're not gonna say point blank this, 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 but one thing leads to the other. These people in the community that are investigating the assassination are sharp, as, as very sharp, and they pick up every little shit. And that's what they're scared of, those people, because they know what, what one thing leads to another, like a link. Um, well, going back to the meeting, so we want to talk a little bit about the casting, because this is one of the all-time great casts. You've got movie stars and great stage actors and old pros like Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon and comic actors like John Candy and Brian Miller Murray. What was your thinking going into this in terms of the casting and what kinds of actors you were looking for and what you wanted from them? I mean, it's just such a rich, rich ensemble. Uh, the idea was, I knew that it was comp comp complex material and I knew the audience. Uh, it's very hard to first time through it to remember who everybody is. So obviously if you put a face like Jack Lemmon or John Candy or Walter Matthau, people recognize the face and they know right away more or less the mood, the feeling, what that person already said in the movie. That's one. Uh, and it's a good way to do it. That's what we use actors for. They, they can become very, uh, like book covers, you know? If they're all unknown people, it's, it's going to be harder, uh, dig deeper thinking. Uh, Hamadonner did a good job with uh, a lot of famous faces. Uh, because there's so many scientists, that it's confusing. Yeah, um, you know, Costner is fantastic in this movie. And I was surprised when I read your uh, memoir that you had offered him Barnes in Platoon. That's and the Kevin Costner. I, yeah, I don't remember the details. Did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's he's in, he's fantastic in this movie. He's a kind of camera esque hero. Um, how did you decide to put him over there? That was one of the reasons you couldn't. He had a brother that was in the other house and he never got it. Um, but, but I'm very happy with Tom Perry and the job he did. Absolutely. Um, but what, were your, what was your working relationship like with Costner? I mean, he at this time was one of the biggest stars in the world. He made the film happen because obviously we went over, we were, our, the script was bigger than, bigger appetite than my stomach. In other words, it was more expensive than we ever thought it came in approximately $40 million, I think, in 1991 uh, terms, 90, 90, 90 and 91 terms. So they wanted to get a partner right away because they didn't want to take the full risk. They were very supportive, believe me, but they brought in 
this guy, Arnold Milchan, is a co-producer, but he put up half the money from Europe. That lessened the burden, and they wanted one star. That's all I asked. So I, we went to Kevin, and we, Kevin was a huge star, as you said. At that point, he was very, very, everything he did was turning to magic. So that made a big difference. We stayed on, uh, uh, we stayed on, and his wife, Cindy, at that time, was very helpful. As was Mike Ovis, who was the head of CIA and was very relatively close to Kevin, and I think they convinced him. I think it's a scary role for him. Harrison Ford turned us down. People like that. Harrison Ford was terrified of, you know, in a way. You have to understand there's a risk here. Once you go play that role, you know, you could be off limits. Uh, so there was fear. Uh, who else turned it down? Uh, probably Bill Gibson. I don't, I, I'm not, no, I don't, I'm, my memory's, I gotta sharpen that up. Uh, I'm writing another sequel to the uh, memoir. Now I'll get into all the details of the diaries. So, yeah, uh, but definitely, it was, it was scary. And uh, Kevin has guns, he has guns. But uh, once he committed, he committed and he stayed on. And it was a tough, he wanted to eat Garrison, he wanted to go through all the case again. And Garrison was very convincing. Uh, well, it would be a scary part, I think, for an actor, too, just the sheer volume of dialogue. He has that courtroom scene at the end of the movie. I mean, everything he has to deliver there, that's, a, I would think, an extremely intimidating set piece for an actor. I mean, was he nervous about that? And how do you, how do you with something like that, with Costner doing that, or Sutherland's speech that happens a couple hours in the movie, how do you create an environment for an actor where they can feel secure and safe and feel like they can pull something like that off. Well, that's a, it's a big speech, and I have to tell you that Kevin was worried about it, and he concentrated on the whole shoot. I mean, he was getting ready to do it. We did it very late, and so he'd done everything else pretty much. So it came at a time when he was ready, uh, and he went to it pretty, it wasn't, it, it didn't take days to shoot it, just, you know, we did it. I have to say, though, he, it was, and he did it, he did it straight. He didn't, I don't think he broke it up. Uh, Don Sullivan is uh, amazing, amazing, because it was a long one, too. That was 13 minutes or 14 minutes, and Don Sullivan is a very smart man and talks very fast, thank God. <laughs> that scene could have gone on for twice that length. He talks fast. <laughs> I I had been dumb enough to go to Marlon Brando. <laughs> well, well, we all love him, and you know, of course, if he'd said yes, God damn it. <laughs> anyway, uh, Marlon, it's <laughs> another story. But, uh, yeah, but, but some of them were very lucky. Well, uh, I'm fascinated by the idea that you went to Marlon Brando. What kinds of conversations did you have with Brando? I'll tell you a nice one. <laughs> Sutherland speech, uh, how, how, I guess, how long does it take you to figure out in a scene like that um, the exact amount of information you're going to get across? Is that something that was like continually evolving through the editing? Did you have to play around with that a lot, or did it stay pretty much the how you had written it? Well, uh, Pietro Scalia is here, and he's one of the others. Because at the trial, 
not only did the Zapruder film get revealed, but also the testimony of Pierre Fink, among others, who was at the autopsy, one of the bad guys. And Fink uh, clearly, clearly shocked the government and upset them that he said the things that he did about not controlling the autopsy. That autopsy was a, was a farce. It was a, it's a key to understand the case if you refer to the documentary we made last two years ago, JFK Revisited, which we go into, this, we go into the, the facts of the case. JFK Revisited, it's called. And the autopsy is a very, is a key element. And we have all these autopsy doctors who talk about it. And all the violations of code that were made on that case. It's unbelievable that the President of the United States gets the cheapest autopsy of all. And it just gets shunted, gets trundled through by a bunch of amateurs at the, uh, at the, in the Navy when the best autopsy people in the world are right next door in Washington and New York, who they ignore them. Yeah, I really recommend that documentary, JFK Revisited, to people who like this movie, because it basically updates this with the 20 years of research that have been, or 30 years of research that have been going on. Yeah, the, the records I did reveal a lot of detail, uh, and the records board, Assassination Records Board, which existed for four years, got that out, those records, and we've seen them all, of course, the media is made fancy of them because, you know, they say, how come people don't reveal? They do reveal. We've had hundreds, dozens of revelations, and people don't put it all together into, the, into one puzzle to understand. They only hear the information in select bites. Well, it was fascinating. We were preparing for this. I went back and I was reading a lot of the commentary that came out at the time. And you had people, you know, you had people like Roger Ebert who loved the movie. A lot of pundits who, you know, had, in my opinion, somewhat not very substantive arguments against the movie. Um, and you've really been proven right. When I read these articles, a lot of the things that people criticize the movie for are things that have proven to be true that they said you were wrong about. And I'm curious for you, just from a sort of stamina point of view, how do you keep going in the face of the assaults? Because this movie, I, I mean, people who weren't there can't, I mean, I remember when this movie came out, I mean, you were just slammed day after day after day in Time Magazine, Nightline, you know, the, the, the mainstream press just sh was shredding you constantly. And how do you keep going after all that? Well, you have no choice, you can't go back. Uh, it's like, once you open the case, like Garrison did, as someone says, you know, he can't go back now. Uh, you're dead deep. Uh, yeah, once I cross the Rubicon there, you can't go back. And it's been a battle for me because it hurts the business. People consider you a troublemaker and a conspiracy theorist, you know, that CIA terminology. Uh, <laughs> and you just can't ever recover the trust with certain people who will back the government no matter what. And, but I, I think what I kept going with was my interest in other subtopics too. You see, I kept making different types of movies for myself. They were challenging for me, very challenging. You've seen a few of them. Uh, and uh, you were involved in one of the biggest disputes of all was the Alexander business. And then there was the National Born Killers business. And then there was all these other businesses that came up. So it's been a busy life. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I'm not scared of the government. They can kill me at this point. <laughs> just, they are so fucking abuse. They don't change the story. They don't even bother to defend this thing. It's, it's, it's uh, I guess I have to laugh, but I do have some anger about how impossible it is to get the truth out of this world, in this country specifically, and how much they continue to lie mm -hmm. about current events. Yeah. Well, and I was thinking about that watching JFK Revisited and then watching your nuclear documentary this year, which is also fantastic. And I'm curious, you know, because of this, this idea that, you know, they just continue to lie and continue to come after you and things like that. I mean, does it make you how are you different now than you were when you made JFK? Are you more passionate, less? Yeah, I have more. I mean, I know more. <laughs> I know more. I mean, all this stuff, this information of the military industrial complex, a lot of it was given to me by Fletcher Browning, and a lot of it was Jim Garrison. Fletcher Browning was an inside guy that Sutherland played. 
he, he had been there since World War II and saw all this shit go down. So many of these people know it. They've been telling this story. Many people have told this similar stories. We know. And yet, we go, we're still under their influence. We, we, we're sending $130 billion to Ukraine based on, based on the same kind of lives. Now, back to the, the movie and the filmmaking component, another thing about this movie that really struck me watching on the big screen tonight is the, the importance of John Williams' score. I feel like the score in this film by John Williams does such a great job of keeping the momentum going, and it's just the, the, the themes in this are some of the best that Williams has ever done. Obviously, you've done a couple other great movies with him. What's your collaboration like with William and Todd? What kind of conversations did the two of you have on a movie like this about the John is very good. He's just one of the best. So gentle with him and easy to get along with. Uh, we, only, we only did three films together, all about Americana. And in each case, he delivered something uh, more than I expected. Or, or uh, he, he deepened and enriched uh, Nixon so much with a, with a dark score. It wasn't as easy accessible as his score. But it was a dark, uh, dark, tragic score. And of course, one of the Fourth of July, made, he made that memorable for many people. Uh, well, that whole Americana idea, something else I really like about this movie is that in some ways it's so modern and so audacious, but that it also has this kind of old fashioned quality to it. And again, it has this kind of Capra esque, Norman Rockwell quality to the stuff with Kevin Costner and his family. Um, where did that idea come from, sort of? have both of those elements in the movie. I mean, on the one hand, you have this movie that's attacking a lot of our institutions and people who run them, but then it's using the iconography of kind of very old-fashioned classical patriotism. Uh, well, uh, uh, old-fashioned in the sense he's how, well, it's Southern. First of all, it's Southern, and there's a tradition in the South, and they're very polite. The world, the world is also one of the most corrupt places I've ever been in my life. It's, <laughs> it's uh, Southern charm. With, the fight in fighting there, the hatred for garrison. And I noticed when I walked in the street, there people loved it. The general population loved it because he was an honest DA. But um, when you get to the uh, in elite class, they were always attacking him for all kinds of reasons, among them Kennedy. But there was the corruption charges that were never proven, and they always kept saying he's in with the mob and all that. So you have all that backbiting going on. Uh, the wife, and he did get a divorce over uh, sometime after this, but I met her a few times, and she was what Sissy portrayed her beautifully, and of course I got a lot of criticism because she wasn't an agent for change. That she never was. She was warning him about, she, and they paid the price. The family was uh, broken up, and the children were probably uh, hurt to some degree because he did get over his head. He didn't get over his head. If you wanted, really, you could make a separate movie of kind of about that case. And the CIA opened the whole kind of file, my, my, a mini department on Garris. They went after him viciously. Uh, with, with me and people, Walter Sharon played a big role. And actually, Robert Kennedy, unfortunately, was misinformed about him. And I think was told horrible things about him and we did not support him in any way. You mentioned being in New Orleans, and this movie has some great just location work between New Orleans and uh, Texas. And uh, I was surprised reading the American cinematographer article on this movie to see that um, the whole courtroom thing at the end was not a set. You guys shot that that on location, and I'm, I'm curious for you. You know, the, the courtroom stuff again said it was all on um, location. You weren't shooting on a set, correct? The courtroom stuff? Oh, the courtroom. The courtroom was in, the courtroom was in well, the morning or something. Yeah, and so um, but then I guess you know, a lot of filmmakers would do something like that on set where they have control. I'm curious for you, do you have any kind of feelings about sets versus locations? Do you feel like shooting on location gives you and the actors something that sets stone? I've done both. I, I can accept both. I like location because it's got a lot of feel, texture, and it helps the cast, I think, to be involved. And also, you don't want them in Los Angeles on the stage because they go home every night. You want to keep them trapped. <laughs> <laughs> Under control and influence. <laughs> Talking about cinematography, I just wish, you see, 
Warner Brothers has not been the same since, uh, and they never made a forecast of this, which is, and you saw the result tonight, it was just scratchy and it wasn't, it wasn't timed correctly. There, and I'm sorry, the, the prints that I've seen are, are really, uh, by Richardson would tell you, it uh, was just not right, but hopefully now we're getting the 4K uh, by accident kind of, so we'll have a 4K of this somewhere in this year. Um, yeah. I'm glad you that, because even the version of this that's streaming right now on Max has like hairs and scratches and stuff, it's ridiculous. Um, well, yeah. there's just been a lot of opposition to it. From, it has not been a critics film, I mean, some critics, but not been a critics film. And, and also, you know, it doesn't get picked for uh, festivals and stuff like that. For some reason, there's fear of, there's some kind of thing around it. Of, it's controversial. Still, <laughs> still it's saying things that people don't want to hear. Well, you mentioned uh, Robert Richardson, and the two of you had an incredible run in the late 80s and early 90s, and I was, I was so happy to see him back with you for JFK Revisited. Um, talk a little bit about that relationship. What do you think made that such a productive director, cinematographer collaboration? Well, whatever makes the love affair work, <laughs> or good sex. <laughs> <laughs> How did you uh, come, how did you come to work with him again for JFK Revisited after so many years apart? How did you come to work with him again for JFK Revisited? That was fun. That was it was fun. It was documentary. It wasn't the same as being on the set and mashing it out. Uh, but uh, it ain't over yet. We'll see. Mm -hmm. um, well, I wanted to ask too about shooting. You recreate the assassination in Dealey Plaza here, which seems to me like something that would just be an incredibly difficult logistical undertaking. I mean, what were the challenges of conceiving and executing that whole well, thing? Well, you can understand everything was a problem. From first of all, getting permission from Daily Plaza was a torturous fight. Uh, location manager Jeff and Clayton Townsend got into it. I had to go in front of the board and answer questions. You know, there was a three to two vote for us, finally. Three to two, barely made it through to get permission to shoot in the actual plaza, which is a big deal. So we closed the whole plaza down to the, to, for the city and we put our own cars in, period cars, everything, and we fire off the shots. Uh, sometimes there'd be volleys of 15, 20 shots, it, it, and we do seven takes. So the whole, all of Dallas would be listening to them, hear this stuff coming from uh, the only plaza, it was quite something. Uh, the whole city was kind of locked into it in a sense. It was a big town in Dallas. So to shoot, it was disgusting, but hard. I mean, it's hard work to kill a person and to do it like with seven cameras and you know, people on radios. The Washington Post is hanging out and ripping you to pieces on, on their daily stories. You know, they were after us and so was a lot of press. They, were, they, they, they saw the first draft of the script. They got it somehow and they, they went after us at that point. So from the beginning we were militated against, uh, it was articles saying it was Alice in Wonderland and, and so forth. Uh, well, I get why the government is after you for a movie like this. I mean, what, are the, what does the press have to gain by attacking it before it comes out? I mean, because we were saying what the press never said. The press never did their job. <laughs> they never did any work. They just accepted the uh, conclusions the conclusions of these people in the uh, Dallas Police Department and uh, so forth. And then also the Warren Commission. They just accepted it. In fact, the Warren Commission, you know how big that was, 23 volumes, whatever, 26 volumes. It came out and the uh, New York Times declared it sacrosanct about two days later. Uh, in other words, who read it? I don't think we really thought about it. <laughs> It's not funny when you think that Warren, Alan Dulles is sitting on the commission and sees everything. And you, I guess some of you know that they never, Dulles then made sure that they knew nothing about the Cuban operation. We, they were never allowed information about what was going on between the CIA and the Cuban community and, the, and theoretically the mob, because the mob was involved in the hit on Castro. So all that was kept away from them. And of course, that would have raised suspicions. You, you would have gone in that direction. Uh, they didn't know anything about Vietnam, nothing. That was all super secret. Uh, the 
end sandals were, were private and, and hidden, for, for, except for some insiders. So Kennedy's end sandal 2263 was, was not known. All this came to my attention because of Fletcher Crowley. And Jim Garrison is pretty close in his book, too, if you read his book. His, his suspicions at the time were pretty uh, amazing. Uh, you mentioned, you know, that you think you maybe have too much information in this movie to a certain extent. That raises a question for me about the editing process. When you and Pietro and Joe are working on the editing of this movie, and you're so close to the information, and you've read every book and every article, everything you can get your hands on, and interviewed all of these people, how do you retain your objectivity about what an audience coming to this fresh is going to think? You know, and, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a very tough question, question because First of all, you have to go off your own instinct. I had researchers, I had people who knew things, very good researchers who knew the details. But you know, at the end of the day, you you have to call it the way you feel it and see it. I made mistakes. I made mistakes, uh, which bugged me. But still, uh, I think uh, I think it's pretty clear that it's pretty clear what's what happened here. <laughs> yeah, definitely, and. Um, you know, again, I'm curious. So you go, you go back and you do JFK, Revisited, and uh, Destiny Betrayed, the longer work. Yeah, I did it because it annoyed me that all this information was coming out of the Assassination Records Review Board, and then they had been chopped up and ignored, basically, by the media. So I felt it was necessary to do an up-to-date version with the new information that was given so people might understand better what happened. And actually, the Without, uh, who distributed it? Do you remember? Uh, well, I know Shop Factory put on a DVD. No, and and Shop Factory is a small outfit. Warner Brothers didn't distribute it, you know. So it, it did very well. It's still number high up on the lists of Amazon and all that as, as a DVD sale. So it's a very, that's very, uh, it shows you people care. Well, the last few years you've been moving into a lot of documentary work, and I'm curious for you, is that a, do you find that documentary filmmaking allows you to express things you weren't able in narrative filmmaking, or is it a matter of yeah. economics, or what's like at a certain point you get, you, once you, I did 20 feature films, and I'm proud of them, and, but at a certain point you do get, you know, you've had your film, you, you, it's a lot of work, and uh, at a certain point you have so much time and you want to get to the point, so the documentaries I made have been important to me on film history in the United States was 12 hours long. I put a lot of hours in it. And it's very important to me to make the history right because we, we don't seem to have a good sense of our own history. Uh, history, uh, on film history, and then there was the, uh, the uh, nuclear, nuclear Now, which just came out. And before that, there was Putin interviews, and there was JFK. And there was Castro interviews and Chavez interviews. I've been trying to, to to get to the big stuff, I mean, the big picture, which is you know basically it's, it's it's not a simple world, but you know you have to wonder why the problems in this film with the military industrial complex are still around, and they're all around us, and it keeps the budgets artificially high in this country, and who the people are benefiting? They shouldn't be there. They shouldn't be. This is a disgusting criminal enterprise that's been going on for a long, long, long time. And it's getting worse. Oh, yeah. uh, so uh, what are you working on now? What do you have coming up next? Uh, I'm uh, working on, there's a strike, I'm not working. <laughs> <laughs>